There were men in the church that came to her and they had sex with her. I, I can't remember if she was standing in front of the church or not or where she was standing, but they walked by her and she said, oh, Big Blue, I know you. And they said, no, 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 I don't know you. I don't know you. And I sat there in the congregation and I'm like, do they know my sin? Do they know that what I've done? Do they know where I've come from? You know, there wasn't a coincidence why I came to this church. It wasn't just out of the blue. You know, I came to this church not wanting to come. But for some reason, God led me to this church. And that play was to show me that there was a problem. That this church was trying to fix their problems. Because they came from one church and they set it down in a, in a church that they're waiting to be building for the next church. And I feel that they're going through a phase right now where they're fixing their problems. So when they get to the new church, God's word can be truly fulfilled at that time. So, if you don't already know, the next step in my lustful phase in my life was soliciting prostitutes with money. And it was a place in life where it was a time in my life where it was very hard. Because I've got to the lowest part of my life. For a real low end. I didn't know how I went wrong. Because I was in the church, folks. I was speaking about God in the church. I was a youth leader in the church. I was a Sabbath school teacher in the church. You know, people looked up to me in the church. But I wasn't living the life that God wanted me to live. And I can see that he wasn't pleased because, you know, there was no fruit from my ministry whatsoever. Because I wasn't living the way that he wanted me to live. So, it came to a point where, again, I told my girlfriend at the time what happened. And again, she took me back. And again, I did the same thing and cheated on her. And she finally left me. And it was the best thing that could have happened to me because if she didn't leave me, I would have just continued with the same trend. Like most of us do. You know, a lot of people in marriages and relationships right now that their loved ones have forgiven them and they still continue to do the same thing over and over and over again. And they don't learn until finally their spouse or their, their girlfriend or boyfriend leaves. And it may have been the best thing to happen in their life. Because until we hit rock bottom, for some reason, for some reason, that's, not a, that's the only time that you'll learn. That's the only time that you'll you probably even look for God. So at that point in time, I still don't want to learn because once she broke up with me, I just found another girl. Because at that time, you know, I was a player who I wanted to be, you know, and I found another girl and every single time I'm out with her, that's, my ex-girlfriend still kept on calling me to try and reconcile stuff. And I said, no, I don't want nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. So, finally I came to my senses and I realized the, where the place I was at is not the place that I wanted to be. So, I called up my best friend, best friend dad, you know, he's in the ministry right now, I wanted to talk to him. And his father came on the line. And um, I go, hello, Mr. Nassan. He goes, hello, Calvin, how are you today? And I'm like, I'm good, I'm good. And he goes, Calvin, there's something, there's something wrong in your voice. There's something, there's, something's not right. And I told him what I was going through. And he goes, you know, go and pray to God and ask him what you should do. And so I prayed to God and asked him what I should do and I tried to go and reconcile my relationship with my girlfriend at the time. And no matter how hard I tried, I kept on, I, it, it wasn't succeeding for no reason. It wasn't succeeding for whatever reason. I don't know why it wasn't succeeding. I was doing what God wanted me to do, but it wasn't succeeding. So it came to a point where at the Kendallwood they were having a, a, a seminar and they were showing a movie called Fireproof. Yes. I don't know if you ever heard about yes. that movie before, Fireproof. Yes. 
You know, I gotta praise God for the Christians on this earth that try to make a stand to help other people in their, in their church to better their relationships. So I said, fire, 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 fire. So I went out, bought the movie, popped it in, and I started watching. It was the worst acting I've ever seen in my whole entire life. <laughs> but the, the message, praise God for the message in the past. <laughs> the message was there. And the message was so true. It came to a point where they were getting divorced. They were in the middle of the divorce. And his father gave him a book called The Love Journal. And he was reading it, reading it, reading it. And in the love journal, there was portions in there where it's telling you what you should do. It was a 40-day love journal. It was portions in the, in the book where it's telling you to do certain stuff every day yes. for God. Yes. And certain stuff every day for, for your wife. Right. And there were scriptures at the end of it. So he was doing it, but he was doing it not truly believing in it. He didn't do it with a full heart, with an honest heart. And so the fruits of his labor, there was nothing there. You know, his wife can see it. You know, it's just something with women. You know, they can see if you're not truly sincere or not. You know, I think it's a gift from God that God has given to them. And. Um, Nothing that he did was prospering at all. And so he talked to his dad and he told his dad that, Dad, it's done. It's not working. I tried it. It's been, I think it was about two or three weeks into it. I, I, I'm done with it. I can't do it anymore. And they came to a point where there was a cross. And God's end, and the, the husband said to his father, Dad, how do I love a person? I continually love a person who consistently spits in my face every day, no matter how much I show love to them. And God said, and his father said, you know, son, I ask myself that question every single day. And the son goes, no, dad, because at, the point, at that point in time, the camera goes onto the cross. And he said, dad, it can't be it. And his father said to his son, how can God love you so much and you continuously spit in his face every day and not living his word, not living according to his word and doing everything and everything that you want against him? That's the type of love that you need to show every day of your life. No matter what your wife does, no matter what your husband does, you are supposed to do what God wants you to do. You're supposed to live the way God wants you to live. And when you live that way, that's the only time that you will prosper in your relationship. Yes. A sacrificial type of love. And as soon as the husband started doing that, that's when his relationship started to prosper. And that's when his wife started to see Jesus working in his life. Taken by example. That's what, they saw. that's what they call it. So I started taking that and adopted that into my own life. And I started doing that with the girlfriend who I was trying to reconcile with. And every single time I did it, it just kept on being spit back into my face, thrown back into my face, thrown back into my face. And I said to God, Lord, give me the strength. Give me the strength because you know I don't have to do this. You know that it's hurting right now. And I'm getting real sick and tired of it. But I kept on doing it. And it came to a point where I knew that me, myself, I was doing it in vain as well. And it came to a point where I knew that I was trying just to get back with her, just to get back with her. And I knew that it wasn't God's will. It came to a point where I knew it wasn't God's will for me to get back with her. Because I realized that I was doing everything in my own power, everything that I wanted to to get back with her. But that's not what God wanted me to do. You know, there's a text in the Bible that talks about, you know, what good is it for a man? to gain everything in the world, but lose his own soul. You know, also pursuing stuff of the world before us pursuing God. So I started pursuing God myself, and I started finding a relationship with God. Amen. A relationship with God. Because that's what we all need, a relationship with God. An intimate relationship with God. You know, it's good to have someone we can talk to, who we can pray to, who won't judge us, who won't look down upon us, who won't cast any ill thought against us, 
but who will only love us. So I started doing that, and I realized that this wasn't the woman for me. Because she was doing stuff that wasn't according to God's will. And I wasn't living that way anymore. That's right. So I started living for God. And church, as soon as I started living for God, that's when I met this fine woman. That's when, <laughs> as soon as I started living for God, church, you know, like I said, I met a woman. I knew her from time. We were going to the same church since I started going to church, started to go to Kendallwood. But I knew of her, but I didn't know her. And my sister was getting married at the time, my oldest sister. And um, I started seeing this woman periodically. I won't tell you who she is, you may know. But I started seeing this woman periodically. And um, I was like, you know what, I haven't seen her in a while. Let me go see what's up with her. So I started talking with her, talking with her, talking with her. And you know, she invited me to this, um, I don't know if you've heard, heard of it before, there was this singles camp, or this couples camp, or whatever it was. There was a singles camp that they had for Christians, for SDA Christians, I believe. And she invited me to it. And I was going to go, but something happened before that, before that time, which didn't end up us going. Because um, we started going out at the time, so there was no need for us to go to no singles camp. <laughs> we, were like that. we started going out, so, you know, it's funny, it was on, well, after the first date, and same night, I asked her out to be my girlfriend. Because I was reading a book before, even before I saw her, and it started, and it said that, you know, if you're looking for a mate, Look for someone who worships God. Amen. Look for someone who is equally yoked as you. Amen. And so as we sat there and we talked at the keg for a long period of time, and I found out that we're on the same page. You know, we wanted to live for God. Amen. We didn't want to have sex before marriage. Amen. We didn't want to do the things that the world wants to do before marriage. So we made, we made a decision that we were going to live for God. Amen. It was a struggle. Yes. But yes. we made it. Yes. But we made it. Yes. And through that time, you know, the story doesn't end there because through that time there were still struggles and trials that we went through. Struggles and trials that most relationships go through. And, you know, I didn't really know how to love a person. Or love a woman because my whole entire life you know my pursuit of women was just to take advantage of them and to get what I wanted out of them you know and I didn't know how to love that woman to the full extent of the way God wanted me to love her and you know I love my father I love my parents so much you know they break their back every day just to go to work you know, my dad can't, sometimes can't even walk because his back hurts and he goes to his factory job and he works 12 hour shifts just to put food on the table for us. And I love him so much for that. And... <clears throat> you know, we need to live by example. And... My father only knew how to be a man or be a father because of his father. You know, his, they, like I said, they grew up in Jamaica and the way that the family is in Jamaica, you know, the mother stayed home and the father went and worked. And they came home. And dad is usually too tired to do anything because he has to work long hours. And the mother prepares the food and, and, and so stuff, and stuff like that. So when you come to bring that mentality into Canada where the mother's working, and the father's working. And, you know, like I said, I love my father very much, but we each have flaws. Yes. You know, and we each only learn from what the other generation teaches you. Yes. And so, he was only able to show me how to be a man by example. And sometimes it wasn't the best example because my mom would come home and there would be no food in the house, no one is cooked, and you know, you're waiting for the mother to cook, and she, and she doesn't want to cook because she's tired. 
You know, and I always told myself that I don't want to have my life to live like that. You know, I don't want that to happen because I've seen the pain of my mother crying at times, not knowing how she's able to get through these trial times because it's been hard. You know, how do you expect to go to work eight hours a day, take care of the kids, and make food for everyone else? You know, it's hard on a mother. You know, and I love them so much for that. So the only way to know how to be a man was by example. And I had my, the examples I had were my brother, and only I had my father and my friends out there. And at times, my friends, they weren't a good example. My brother, he wasn't a good example. And all I had to look up to was my father. And so I brought my mentality of how to be a man and how to love into my, into my marriage. And bringing that into the marriage, we had, we had problems. Problems. Not only not having to love, but pornography was still a problem. It was still a struggle. Because you may try to deal with it your own self, but you can't get through it your own self. You can't do it by yourself. You know, and I praise God for the wife that he's given me because she's a strong woman. She's a strong woman who loves God. She's a strong woman who doesn't take foolishness. You know, I remember I was talking to her father-in-law and at my, at my wife's, at my, sorry, my sister's wedding, he goes, I feel sorry for the man who marries my daughter. <laughs> and we were on the balcony, we were on the porch that day, and I just didn't understand, you know. And, you know, I never had, I never dated a black woman before, you know. You know, it was different. <laughs> you know, they're for her, you know. You know, I praise God for a strong black woman, you know. Praise God. You know, it's good to have a strong black woman because, or whoever you're with, a strong woman indeed. Because they were there to, you know, guide you. You know, they'll be there to speak to you. They'll be there to push you on the right track when you're off the wrong track, when you're off the right track. And she was there nonstop, nonstop. And I'm like, Lord, is this the life? <laughs> I've never experienced this before in my life, you know. I'm just used to, you know, timid work, you know. You know, timid women I can take advantage of. For any word that I said, they'll listen. So when you get a woman who's strong and who's for God and who's a virtuous woman, it's hard to it's hard to understand that and to and to walk and to live that way because you're not used to it whatsoever. So, I brought everything that was not of God into that marriage and it's been trials and tribulations from, from day one because selfishness is there. Yes. You know, selfishness is something that's taken over every, everybody in this church today. You know, it's destroying families. It's destroying churches. It's destroying relationships, selfishness. God wants us to show that self-sacrifice, you know, that selflessness to each other. And I couldn't wrap, can't wrap my head, I couldn't wrap my head around that. And, you know, the only way that our relationship could get better and did get better was when we humbled ourselves to God. And as soon as we humbled ourselves to God, there was progress. You know, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Because too many people who, get, who are young and get married end up in divorce too quickly. And God hates divorce. God made marriage to be a lifelong marriage. A lifelong marriage. So trials and tribulations we went through then. I told myself that, you know, enough's enough. You know, we fought a lot. There was a lot of emotional abuse in our relationship. A lot of fighting in our relationship. A lot of selfishness in our relationship that we couldn't overcome. So I told myself, you know, it was enough enough. I need to get help. Amen. So I got help for myself. Amen. I enrolled in an anger management course. Amen. I enrolled in a sexual addiction course. Amen. I enrolled in it because I want to make myself better yeah. for my wife. You know, so when my future children come up, when my four future children come up, I'll be able to show them the right way. 
I'll be able to let them know how to truly love a woman of God. You know, God's not going to give you a woman, a virtuous woman, if you are not able to treat that woman right. God's not going to give you a man if you're not going to treat him right. You know, it goes both ways. It doesn't go one way. So I decided to do that. And it's still a struggle, church. It's still a struggle. But God said it was never going to be easy. When you try to live for God, the devil's going to be at you for every day he's trying to bring you down. But I'm here to let you know that don't give up. Don't give up. But God said that he will never leave you or forsake you. Never leave you or forsake you. He's there. He's the rock. Our Savior. The light of the world. Jesus Christ. He came down to save you and he came down to save me. And he's been doing that for me ever since I was born. He's been guiding me. And protecting me. Walking with me. And talking with me. And I thank him for that. I thank him for everything that he's done for me. You know, I thank my family. I thank my church family. I thank my new church family. Amen. Soon enough, I will be transferring my yes. to this church. That's if you still have me. Because I know that I'm not the perfect man. You know, I'm a bad man. But I'm a good man. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. Like I said, I, I, I truly didn't know what, what God had in store for today. You know, I had everything planned out. I had everything written out. I don't know what appeal to give to you. I don't know exactly what to say to you today to truly live for Christ. To truly live, to live for Him. Not just by talk, Amen. but by the walk. Amen. Walk the walk, church. Live the way God wants you to live. Act the way God wants you to live. And only then will there be a true revival in this church. Yes. Only then will His Word be able to grow and flourish in the new people that we bring into this church. Because if we don't change ourselves, if we don't ask God to help us change ourselves, how can we truly do His work? So I ask you to stand to the end of the church as the first thing comes up. start singing the song. The only thing that I have to say to the church is make a decision for God. You know, this youth month, the people who spoke this youth month wasn't by coincidence. I've only been in this church for not even a year and I was already asked to preach for whatever reason. And I know it was God. It was only God who inspired God only who inspired his pastors to ask these people, these three people to speak for God. And I thank Jesus Christ for everything he's done for us. Today. So if you're ready to make that change for God, if you're ready to walk with him and talk with him and have an intimate relationship with God, I ask you to come to the front.